Our next session will be presented by a good friend of mine, Dr. Sahar Badrud. She will present current and new surgical treatment options for glaucoma. Dr. Badrud received her medical degree at the Keck School of Medicine at USC and completed her ophthalmology residency at Tohini Eye Institute, the University of Southern California and LA County Hospital. She then did her glaucoma fellowship as, at, as, a, as a Society of Heed Fellow at the Wilmer Eye Institute at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Bedrood is currently at Acuity Eye Group in Pasadena, California, and as well as clinical per assistant professor at USC Roski Eye Institute and Los Angeles County Medical Center, where she teaches ophthalmic surgical training to the residents. Man, that was a long intro, but then, and then again, she's awesome. Please welcome Dr. Sahar Bedrood. Thank you, Paul. I'm excited to present to you guys current and new surgical treatment for glaucoma. These are my financial disclosures. We've talked a lot about what glaucoma is, but the truth is, is we don't really know all that much about the disease. But what we do know is that eye pressure and nerve damage go hand in hand. So the higher the eye pressure, it somehow puts this mechanical stress on the nerve and it, we don't know exactly how, but it somehow starts to degenerate the nerve over time. I have images here on the right-hand side that shows a picture of the optic disc. This is what we look at when we look inside the eye. And we look at this thing called the cup to disc ratio, which here is shown as this white area is the cup and the larger area here is the disc. And all this pink yellow tissue is healthy tissue. So when the cup is bigger, like in these other images here, then we are a little bit worried that we are losing healthy nerve tissue. And the thought is that the eye pressure is, has some kind of role in that and it pushes on the nerve and causes this damage. So our goal is always to lower the eye pressure, reduce the eye pressure. It's actually the only thing we do as glaucoma surgeons um, is somehow implement surgical therapy or drops to reduce the eye pressure. And so what are the non-surgical therapies? You wanna think about uh, the things that are really traditional, eye drops to lower the eye pressure. You um, typically will have these drops, you can see the images here. Those drops can be up to four different bottles for any one patient. And traditionally that's been, that's been around for, for 30 years and plus. Now, the newer types of non-surgical therapy is dropless, dro uh, dropless pellets or implants. These actually release medication inside the eye. Here you can see there's an image of this little implant. It's made of a material that actually has the drug inside of it. And over time, the drug comes out and it treats the patient for up to three, four months plus and can get the pressure down really nicely. That is going to be the horizon of glaucoma therapy. There's already one on the market now and we I've implemented into my own patients. And I think that that's where it's gonna go because the truth is it's difficult to take drops. So if we can take that burden off patients, then we have done them a service. Here's an example of that particular slow release implant that I'm talking about. That is Bimatopros SR. So maybe you have heard of Bimatopros or Lumigan, it's an eye drop. That eye drop is actually placed on this pellet, as you can see in this image below. And I have a video of me showing the placement of it. It takes less than 30 seconds. I stabilize the eye and I place the injector into the eye. And as I place, press down on the actuator button, the implant comes out. And you can see here that white small implant right there and that part of the eye. And then you, you, you stop it, you, you move on. And that basically is in, uh, as short as it is. It's actually done in the office uh, and it can be done in the OR or the office, but generally speaking is um, a pretty straightforward procedure. Right now, that particular implant is approved for a one-time delivery. Uh, but I do think that the, the future of glaucoma dropless therapy is going to be somehow implementing multiple therapies once or twice a year to get that pressure lowering without having the pressure uh, patients use the drops. 
What other things are in the future of drug delivery and targeted therapy? We talked about that implant that goes into the anterior chamber. We call that intracameral implants. There are also devices that can be actually physically anchored into the angle of the eye and it eludes the drop over time. Those are surgical. So we would maybe do it at the time of cataract surgery. These are not out on the market yet. This is just kind of the future, what, what to look forward to. Uh, there are contact lenses that people are trying to um, innovate and discover that have the drug on the contact lens. So when you place it into the eye, it eludes the drug, drug over time. Canalicular, if anyone's ever had plugs placed for dry eye, this would be very similar. The plug is placed into the corner where there's a drainage system for the tears. It's different than the drainage system inside the eye. These are on the eyelids. And this eludes drops over time as well, gives it to the area, it gives it to the surface of the eye over time, basically. Um, and then the port delivery is really far off into the horizon, but is used in other uh, diseases like macular degeneration, where there's a little port that's implanted into the eye. And every few months, a drop is, uh, or a drug is delivered into that port and eluded over time. So these are really um, incredible innovations in the eye field. And I think that the discussion about how we're gonna treat this disease is really gonna change over the next 10 years or so. And now we have a question from one of our patients. Hi, my name is Trin Green. What are the different laser treatments for glaucoma? Great question. The, the different laser treatments for glaucoma uh, that are non-surgical, not in the operating room, include something called SLT, which is selective laser trabeculoplasty. What that is, is a low light laser that we actually aim to the drainage system. And you can see the image here below. It creates these little indents into the drainage system. And what that does is it stimulates that area, it reforms and remodels to help with the drainage. Again, we don't know a whole lot about why glaucoma happens in some patients, but if we can increase and encourage that drainage of the eye, the fluid of the eye, then we can lower the eye pressure. And another laser procedure that is done in the operating room, but is considered non-surgical because there are no cuts made into the eye, is something called CPC or micropulse. That stands for cyclophotocoagulation. What that is, a laser is aimed at something called the ciliary body, and it actually just shuts down the ciliary body so it doesn't produce the fluid that is associated with high eye pressure. Um, that again is done in the operating room and it usually involves anesthesia. And then we think about traditional glaucoma surgery. Glaucoma surgery has really evolved over the last 10 years, but prior to that, for the past 30 years or so, people have done traditional glaucoma surgery. That is a way to create a microscopic drainage outflow system, either via a natural passageway, which I'll discuss, which is called a trabecula, trabeculectomy, or to place a tube into the eye to help drain excess fluid out. The goal of any of the surgery is truly to lower the eye pressure, slow the progression of disease. So let me get into some of the um, examples of traditional glaucoma surgery. Uh, trabeculectomy is one that I still do. Uh, I took this image from a uh, really informative guide for patients, and it was by my fellowship me mentor, Dr. Harry Quigley, and I recommend it to patients. It's very reader friendly, so I would, again, recommend it. But here we have an image of the eye. In a trabeculectomy, you're creating a microscopic passageway. In order to do that, I create this, um, I push back the, the white covering of the eye on the top, and then I create this little window here, and you see this black hole. This, actually, this hole actually is the passageway. That tiny little hole will allow fluid to go from inside the eye to outside of the eye. So the pressure is up, it goes through this passageway. Now, if I left this little window completely open, there would be 100% flow, and the eye would not do well and it would shrink because the pressure would be too low. So I don't actually, I don't leave it open like this. 
in a trabeculectomy, we actually close that flap with very loose stitches. And the fluid goes around the sides of the, of the stitches and the flap and creates this kind of very slow, natural oozing. Um, and that is the most successful type of trabeculectomy. Here is a picture of what it looks like once we've covered that area up again. And over time, it creates this thing called a bleb or a blister. And this is, again, this natural passageway remodeling of that little area of the eye. If I see a bleb like this, I know the surgery is working. Um, and we, we have probably good success based on the pressure and the way that the, the surgery looks. Another option for the most traditional glaucoma surgery are aqueous shunts or tubes. Tubes are actual devices. So a trabeculectomy, there's no device, but in a tube, you have a device that's placed into the eye. And these take the, you know, the fluid from inside the eye to the back of the eye. Um, and you can see this device here, it's placed in here. In this particular one, this is called an Ahmed tube. It is valved. What that means is there's a little valve right in here, and this valve allows for a controlled release. So when the pressure is too low, the valve is closed. And when it's high, the valve opens and pressure goes out or fluid goes out into the back of the eye. There are also options for non-valve tubes called bar valve tubes. Uh, your physician will decide which one is appropriate for you. The non-valve tubes um, tend to open later, uh, and you know there's a lot of pros and cons with it, which goes outside the scope of this particular talk. Uh, but usually physicians have a preference for one or the other, or depending on the situation. But the, the concept is the same. There's gonna be a silicone tube that's placed in the eye, and it shunts fluid from one area to another area that um, won't allow for any damage. And now we have another question from one of our patients regarding glaucoma surgery. My name is R. Takahara and I have a question. What is the recovery and post-operative care after glaucoma surgery? The post-operative care and recovery for glaucoma surgery is a really important thing to discuss. The eye will likely have a patch after surgery or a shield for 24 hours. If you have a trabeculectomy or tube, there's usually a patch and a shield. Uh, some of the more less invasive procedure will just have a clear shield for people to look through. The post-operative drops include a steroid and an antibiotic that start on the day of surgery uh, and then continue anywhere from one to three months depending on your physician's regimen. Uh, you can expect during that first three months to have some changes done to your glaucoma drops. I personally usually stop the glaucoma drops if the pressure is okay, and then we'll add back if we need to. And things that the patient should expect are more fre frequent vis visits to the clinic for the first couple of months after surgery, because we wanna see, all right, is the surgery working? Does this patient need additional drops? Do we need to reduce the steroid? A lot of questions that we go through as physicians, um, and so that really results in a couple more visits than usual. And some of the restrictions we discuss is about a one week uh, restrictive time in which you can't lift heavy objects and you can't bend over for a prolonged period of time. I always tell my patients, you can bend over quickly if you need to grab a pencil, but I don't want patients head below their heart for a long period of time during that first week because it creates a lot of pressure onto the eyes. Um, and to expect visual changes that, it can, that can occur for up to three months after surgery. As the stitches are placed and stitches dissolve over time, it can change the vision. So it's something to really keep in mind for our patients. And next, we have another question from the audience. Hello, my name is Jeanette Marquez. And the question I have is, what is the difference between a minimally invasive surgery and a traditional glaucoma surgery? That is a really great question. As we evolve as surgeons and as medicine evolves, we really have changed the way that we do surgery. And that is one of the most beautiful parts about being in medicine and being in glaucoma at this time, because there's something called minimally invasive surgery. And what that is, is a new glaucoma surgery that is lower risk and involves minimal disruption of tissue and a more rapid post-operative recovery. 
It sounds delightful, right? It's not for every patient. And we'll go through some of the different examples here, but it is um, definitely an, another option we can offer some of our patients. So what is it exactly? Minimally invasive glaucoma surgery is considered a lower risk surgical intervention. The treatment typically occurs earlier in disease than traditional surgery. So 15, 20 years ago, we may have said, oh, you know, you're gonna need a trabeculectomy, but we wait, we put patients on a lot of drops and we wait until, until they showed some significant advancement because we didn't wanna put them at risk for surgery. In minimally invasive surgery, since the risk of surgery is so much lower, we are able to offer this to patients earlier and it can lower the pressure and reduce the um, progression of glaucoma. It has a generally speaking, a higher safety profile. And um, the one thing to know is when you have a, a low risk procedure, you oftentimes have low benefit, right? So there's sometimes it be less effective than the traditional surgery. So that's something to discuss with your physician if you're a candidate for these. And the different types of surgeries for these, um, I won't go into the details of this image, but in minimally invasive surgery, we either can uh, create a change in number one, which is our angle, the trabecular metric. That's where the fluid, most of the fluid goes out of. We can insert bypass that area. We can um, take off the roof of that area. I'll go into, into examples specifically. There's something called a suprachoroidal space. No products are really on the market for that right this second. There was some before. I anticipate seeing some in the future that helps shunt away fluid from the inside of the eye to the outside. And then you have the subconjunctival space, which is this area here. And I'll go into an example of these. Before I do, we have to discuss the factors that a physician considers when we think about MIGS or minimally invasive surgery. One is, one question I always ask, is the patient undergoing cataract surgery or will they soon? Because if they're going undergoing cataract surgery, then we can offer them minimally invasive angle surgery that helps uh, reduce the pressure by doing some changes into that drainage system. And some of them are only approved to do in conjunction with cataract surgery. So oftentimes, if I have a patient who has glaucoma and also has cataracts, I will offer them some kind of other glaucoma surgery to help get them off of a drop or two if I can. Uh, other things to consider, let's say we, we, cataract is not an issue, but the patient is intolerant to drops. They're, they cause redness and itching, or maybe they don't wanna put them in, it's difficult to remember, uh, or they have arthritis, they can't open the bottles every day. Those are really significant factors. We have to think about that when we discuss surgery with our patients. If they're intolerant to drops, then I am more eager to get them off the drops and do something surgical. And in this minimally invasive realm, I'm not afraid to, to do those surgeries because the risk is a lot lower than some of the more traditional surgeries. Other questions we ask, is the eye pressure above the target? Is it early in disease? So what I mean by that, let's say we go, you go to the physician, your pressure is always above where we want it to be. Well, this is a good time to introduce a concept of some kind of minimally invasive surgery. Um, if, especially if the patient's early in the, in the disease, then this is, a, this is a good time to do it. Open angle versus angle closure. There are different types of MIGS surgeries for those two different disease processes. So let's go into a few of the examples that you may run into when you talk to your doctor. Angle-based mix. So this is stuff called like the eye stent, hydrus, omni, hook. These are words that people may use because we tend to use the brand name when we're talking to the patient. Um, and here are examples of pictures of each, but I'm just gonna focus here. This is an image of the angle. This particular thing is called an hydrus microstent. It goes in, to the angle and it creates this little, this is a little circle and it creates a little scaffold in the angle. So it opens up the angle and allows for the collector channels to have better access or the aqueous humor or the fluid of the eye to have better access to the collector channels. The eye scent is a device that's implanted that bypasses all of that and accesses the collector channels more easily. Cahook dual blade is just a fancy name for what we call a goniotomy. 
goniotomy is that we just simply remove that first layer of the angle. If, you know, if here, if you can see the kind of pigmented area here, it would be removing that roof of it so you can access the drainage system of the eye a little bit better. Um, and then here, the Omni device is simply a device that we use to uh, thread a little guide wire across the whole drainage system. This is a really nice picture of the drainage system of the eye. And it opens, first it opens up that whole drainage system, it's called canaloplasty. And then goniotomy is it takes off that, that first layer, the roof of the, of the trabecular meshwork, so you have better access to it. There are different reasons why we would use any of these for different patients. So it's really patient and selection um, focused on, on these. Here is a video of I sent inject. This is approved during cataract surgery. Typically I will do the cataract first. So in this case, I've already done the cataract surgery. I go in with the, the, the injector, I unsheath it, I aim for that drainage system. I press down on the actuator button. You release the stent. You can see the little metal of that stent. You move to another part of the drainage system. You do the same thing. And then here, I just kind of tap the stent to position it a little bit better. And you can see this little trickle of blood that came out, which is perfect. I know that it's in the right place when I've accessed a little bit of blood. And then we move on. So that was the angle. That was one part of surgery. Typically, those are approved during cataract surgery. Another type of MIGS or minimally invasive glaucoma surgery is something we call subconjunctival. So it's a little tube. Similar to the tubes we talked about earlier in traditional glaucoma surgery, but actually this tube is much, much smaller, therefore reducing the risk of, of having extra low pressure, which is something we don't want in glaucoma surgery. So these are really small tubes. This is an image of the tube inside the eye. Um, it's just about a millimeter in placement here, very small. You hardly can see it even on the exam. And then this is what it looks like on the outside of the eye. Honestly, you, you can hardly see this as well. But if you remember the bleb, that blister I showed in, um, in trabeculectomies, this is supposed to be similar, but a lot lower profile, a low lying bleb here. You can see kind of the white of the outline here. Um, and then you have, this is the stent itself for the Zen. This is a Zen stent. Goes in from the inside of the eye to the outside of the eye and shunts the fluid away. There is something also coming on in the horizon. It's not approved yet in, in the US, but it's called Preserflow. And it does, it's the same idea. It's a little tube that's placed into the eye and it shunts the fluid outside of the eye. There are just nuanced differences between these devices. And each tiny little nuance will change the overall result. Uh, so we're looking forward to seeing what those, how this plays a role in our glaucoma surgeries. Here's an example of placement of a Zen. If you're squeamish about eye surgery, I would maybe <clears throat> suggest turning off the screen or not looking, maybe just listening. Um, but here I place, this is what's called a stay suture. It helps me evert the eye down so that the patient doesn't have to hold the eye down the whole time. I mark the eye with a marker, which allows me to identify an area in which I, I can, I, I'm gonna aim through those. It's like going through a goalpost. And then I very gently slide the needle along the conjunctiva underneath it. So I'm actually, that little layer of the eye is completely clear. Um, and then I go in and I place it into the eye and then I use the injector to gently eject it out while I remove the needle from the eye. You can see this flush of water come out. Well, that is actually all the excess fluid. And what happens is over time, that fluid comes out of the tube. You can see the yellow of the tube right there, comes out of the tube and um, allows for drainage and pressure control of the eye. And then I usually will place a medicine inside the eye that will help reduce um, scarring. This is an off-label use of, of this particular device. Um, and every physician may use a different type of technique for this. So in summary, we've talked about glaucoma and the treatment. It can be treated with drops, with laser, or with surgery. There have been tremendous advancements that have been made towards dropless therapy for glaucoma. 
We've talked about traditional surgery and minimally invasive surgery and how it can be used to lower the eye pressure and slow down the progression of eye disease. And the advent of MIGS or minimally invasive glaucoma surgery has really changed the landscape of how we approach glaucoma and how we treat patients these days. It's been a real pleasure presenting this to you and I look forward to answering some questions.